Welcome to the Invivo Imaging with Success Knowledge Sharing Video Forum. I'm Dr. Alexandra Delisle and Director of Technical Applications at Perkin Elmer. Today we will discuss the basics of in vivo optical imaging in two short videos. This video covers part one, tissue optics. If you have questions and want to explore further, feel free to email me at alexandra.delisle at perkinelmer.com. The fundamental pillars of success for in vivo imaging research rest on the choice of animal, the choice of imaging modality, and the choice of imaging reporter. Which imaging reporter to choose from? In this slide deck, we emphasize the pillars of success for optical imaging. When evaluating optical imaging reporters, there are many to choose from, such as bioluminescent enzymes, fluorescent proteins, fluorescent dyes, nanoparticles in quantum dots, chemiluminescent probes, as well as certain PET and SPEC probes that emit Cherenkov light. Here you can see an example of a 3D tomographic reconstruction of a mouse with a firefly luciferase tag tumor in the knee. Pseudocolored in green, co-targeted with a fluorescent 2-deoxyglucose pseudocolored in red, and co-registered with a micro-CT image for anatomical reference. Tissue transparency. An important question to ask is which reporters will give you the highest sensitivity? While this directly correlates with the tissue transparency, which is wavelength dependent. When illuminating tissue, for example my finger, with a laser of 525 nanometers, which emits green light, much like GFP or fluorescein, the light is mostly absorbed and there is poor tissue transparency. However, when shifting to the red, and in this case using a laser that emits at 640 nanometers, one clearly observes the increase in tissue transparency to light. This is exactly the case in animals as well. Bone is very transparent to light, however blood vessels contrast as hemoglobin quenches light severely below 600 nanometers. Therefore, the most difficult organs to image optically are highly perfused, such as the liver and the spleen. This phenomenon can be scientifically illustrated in an absorption coefficient over wavelength graph. Wavelengths below 600 nanometers are shaded in gray, as these are suboptimal reporters for in vivo imaging while reporters that excite and emit above 600 nanometers will maximize sensitivity as the absorption by hemoglobin is significantly reduced in this part of the spectrum. Note the insert, illustrating the window of opportunity between 600 and 900 nanometers. Above 900 nanometers, light is quenched again by water absorption. Comparing bioluminescence versus fluorescence. Here we compare the two optical modalities bioluminescence versus fluorescence. Bioluminescence generally originates from the interaction of a bioluminescent enzyme with an injected substrate. Photons are emitted from the source and scattered throughout the tissue to generate a surface radiance which is subsequently detected by the imaging system. As opposed to confocal microscopy, mice are too thick to z-stack through. Therefore, measurements are based on surface radiance intensity, which correlates directly with the size of the source. For fluorescence, one does not need to inject a substrate, but we expose the animal to an exterior excitation light source, represented in green arrows. The excitation light penetrates the tissue, excites the source, subsequent photons are emitted that scatter throughout the tissue and again generate a surface radiance which is then captured by the imaging system. One can observe two major differences between bioluminescence and fluorescence. While signal brightness of bioluminescent sources is generally lower than fluorescent sources, we still obtain higher sensitivity because of the very low level of autoluminescent noise around 10 to the third photons per second. 
in comparison to the high autofluorescent noise in the orders of 10 to the 8 photons per second caused by the non-specific excitation light induced autofluorescence of proteins in the skin. Combating autofluorescence Fortunately, autofluorescence tapers off in the near-infrared. Here is a simple experiment illustrating this concept. Two field mice without any fluorescent reporters were imaged with the appropriate excitation and emission filters at 5, 6, 7 and 800 nanometers. Photon intensity is visualized in a rainbow color scale where blue is a low concentration of photons and red is high. This makes it easy to observe the high level of autofluorescence at 500 nanometers and the significantly lower signal at 800 nanometers. When comparing the top panel to the lower panel, strong autofluorescence originates from the intestinal cavity around 700 nanometers. This is caused by chlorophyll in food and can easily be eliminated by placing the animals on an alfalfa-free mouse chow. Therefore, we recommend 1. to work in the red end of the spectrum and 2. to switch animals to an alfalfa-free diet if imaging for fluorescence. On the right I have posted a list of suggested commercial low autofluorescence diet diets. Food is irradiated for immunocompromised animals. These images further illustrate signal to noise in various mouse optical imaging settings. The line profile clearly illustrates the intensity of signal versus the intensity of background noise. This is very crisp in bioluminescence, as illustrated on the left panel, while the middle panel shows the abundant noise in, inf in a fluorescent image, which is subsequently removed by means of spectral and mixing techniques for superficial sources or by means of normalized transmission fluorescence imaging for deep tissue fluorescent sources. We will elaborate on these techniques in a subsequent video. Thanks for viewing this knowledge sharing presentation. Stay tuned for part 2, the basics of optical imaging, kinetics and animals. If you have questions, feel free to contact me by email at alexandra.delil at perkinammer.com.